Okay, hi everybody, welcome to the next video. Um, so as a review, what we've learned about so far is this cool technique called memoization. And any recursive algorithm that we have, we can use this idea of memoization, which is just saving the previous values in a hash map, uh, like a dictionary in Python, um, in, in order to avoid having to recompute the same thing over and over again. So you can apply this to any recursive algorithm. It's not always going to help. So for many recursive algorithms that we've seen before, like merge sort, um, you're not going to be sorting the same exact list multiple times. So memoization probably wouldn't hurt a lot, but it'd be a little bit wasteful to save that extra memory. Um, but then for a lot of the problems that we've seen, especially optimization type problems, then memoization can really be very helpful and, and make things sometimes uh, go from an exponential time to a polynomial time uh, algorithm. So that's great. And what we're going to learn about next is a new technique called dynamic programming. And it's really related. It's like the successor to memoization. I like to think of dynamic programming as like memoization once we know what we're doing. Um, so instead of starting kind of starting from the top down with the recursive algorithm of memoization with dynamic program we just build the table directly so rather than saying we have this recursive algorithm and we're going to use a table to speed it up in dynamic programming we say let's just build that table and so when you when you build the table um, then at the end the final answer is just the last table entry So once we've built up the whole table, then we just return the last thing in it, and, and, that's, and that's what we were looking for anyway. So let's look at a couple examples that we've already seen, but kind of look at it from the dynamic programming side, and then we'll think about what are the advantages or disadvantages. So let's think about Fibonacci. This is the first memoization example that we saw. So if you were computing Fib of 12, what we saw before is how you might do this in a memoized way, is you would say like, I want fib of 12, and so you would get fib of 11 and fib of 10, and then fib of 11, you would need fib of 10 and fib of 9, and you would do this and do this and do this, and then when you come back up, you would like save that fib of 10 is 55. So you would save that in a table so that when you go over here, you don't have to do any more work, you just return 55 immediately. Okay, so that, that's what we did before. So we kind of have this tree structure. That was memoization, where we get this like tree structure. structure. What does it look like from a dynamic programming standpoint? Is we're just going to build this table. We're just going to say, okay, what do we actually store in this table at the end of the day from computing FIB of 12? Well, we have the Fibonacci values for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 11. And so why not, instead of doing this table thing, the, the, sorry, this tree thing, this kind of complicated, uh, I just dropped my pen, so I have to pick it up. <laughs> instead of doing this complicated um, tree kind of solution, we can just fill in this table directly, starting from, from the beginning. So fib of zero is zero, fib of one is one, and then each one of these values is gonna be the sum of the previous two. This is kind of, so like four, fib of four is the sum of one plus two is three, five. So I'm just, each time I'm looking back at the previous two values and adding them up. I was about to say, this is kind of what I think you would do if you were trying to, um, so there's, there's 55 is fib of 10. If you were trying to compute this by hand, I think you would probably do something like this. Um, you wouldn't really start from the top level. You would probably just build it up until you get to the answer that you, um, that you wanted. So what is this? Um, 144. Okay, so what's the advantage of the dynamic programming version here is it's really doing the same asymptotically the same amount of work as the memoized version it maybe takes a little bit more ingenuity to come up with it the dynamic programming version but then once we come up with it it's so much simpler it's like oh my god this is the way that we have to do it um okay so let's look at another example the the cubert problem that we saw as a puzzle so this really isn't about the cubert game although this is a fun silly arcade game from the 80s that I encourage you to look up. Um, I 
Uh, it's a little bit before my time, but in the few times that I've played it, I found it highly frustrating. So the, the goal of this, as we formulated it, was to find the, the highest sum from the top of the pyramid to the bottom. And so again, for the memoized way, we start at the top at five, and then we say, okay, is the highest sum going down to four or down to eight? And then from four, you would say, is it better going down to nine or down to two? And then kind of work your way back up recursively. Well, the memoized way is we just work our way up from the bottom. So at the bottom, we have one, four, seven, and two. Those are the best sums from there. And then we just compute the best sum from between one and four, adding nine. I would rather add nine to four, so that's gonna be 13. And uh, I'll save a little arrow there, and I'll talk about that in a second. From between four and seven, I would rather go with seven. So um, seven plus two is nine. And then I'm thinking about this three. Between seven and two, I would rather go to the seven. So that gives us 10. Okay, then moving up um, for this four between 13 and nine, 13 is bigger. So I'd rather go there. So that gives me 17. And then eight between nine and 10, I would rather go to 10. So that gives me 18. And now for five, I'd rather go to 18 to give me a total of 23. And so what did I actually save at each point? So here, here it's not exactly obvious how this table is stored, but I think you could imagine like this is going to be um, a two-dimensional table with like index 0, 1, 2, and 3, and then going across like this would be index 0, this would be index 1 of each row, this would be index 2, and this would be index 3 right here. So you would kind of build it up like that. And notice that what I'm saving in each entry here is not only the best value, but also the kind of path information. In this case, it's just like one more step. Do I, do I go left or right? Um, so here it could just be a bool, but in general, it, it might be something else. Um, so for the Fibonacci, that's not really a, an optimization problem. So there's no path to save. Like each number is always going to be the sum of the previous two. But when we're thinking about these kind of optimization problems, a lot of times we want not just what the value is, but also kind of how do we get there? What's the route to get there? And so then what you usually do is you save in your table, not just the best value, but also kind of what was the last step to get there? And again, my, what, what's the benefit here is that now we have this thing in a table. It's just a 2D array, in fact. And once we finish, we can read off the highest value, just the last table entry, and then follow the kind of hours that we've stored to see what the, um, what the actual best path is. Okay, so in general, dynamic programming, how does it compare to the memoized version of the same algorithm? Well, the runtime is gonna be actually basically the same. This might be surprising, but if you think about it, um, so we're gonna have the same big O runtime usually, um, because what are we doing like for the um, recursive version or the dynamic programming version is really the same amount of work for the same number of steps. It's just that here we start from the top to figure out what we're doing and then go all the way down and then build our way back up and save things in a table. Here we save things explicitly in an array and start from the bottom and just work our way up. Um, so the, the main difference in the runtime is that we have a big theta and, uh, th and the main thing is that it's worst case. So if you remember, one of the kind of downfall disadvantages, I'll say, of memoization is that usually it's depending on hashing. And then for hashing, things can go wrong. You can get an unlucky hash table. Things can be a collision, separate chaining, all that stuff that usually doesn't happen, but sometimes it does. And so we can never really get a good worst case running time when we're using hashing. But now we can. So for like Fibonacci, we don't have to worry about any hash functions here or anything like that because we're just building up this array directly. Same here for the Cuber problem. We're just building up this array directly. There's no problem that things are going to collide. Okay, um, so what about space? Well, again, it's going to be the same big O 
amount of space. The table is going to take the same amount of space regardless. It's just that instead of using a hash table, we're directly storing it in an array. Um, but it's a little bit better. Oh, okay, so um, what about figuring it out? So what I mean by this is what, how hard is it to come up with the dynamic programming solution? I would say it's usually harder. Usually it's a little bit harder um, for dynamic programming to come up with it than with memoization. Why is for memoization, we just need a recursive algorithm and then we kind of let the, um, the table lookups do the rest of the work for us. So memoization is usually kind of easier to come up with the idea once you can get the recursive structure of the problem. Um, but then, uh, you know, there's some other disadvantage of it. Dynamic programming is kind of when we actually understand how the memoization is working, then we can have this um, kind of simpler, just direct method to build up the table. But the, the advantage, so one of the big advantages with dynamic programming, because so far it's not looking so hot, it's got the same big O runtime and space and it's harder to come up with it. Um, the analysis is much easier for dynamic programming. So that's an advantage. I said that I really like to think of dynamic programming as kind of memoization once you understand what it's doing. So here, for the original Cuber, we have to think about like how, what are the number of distinct recursive calls? Okay, for Fibonacci, we have to think about what are the number of distinct recursive calls in the memoized version? How far is it going to go down? When we're just building up this table, it's very obvious what the runtime is. It's, it's n time. It's just you do a constant amount of work for every entry of this table till you get to the end. Um, you, for this Cubert table thing, it's a two-dimensional array, so it's something like n squared. Right? It's well, it's exactly big theta of n squared to build this table. Before, when we like in class, when we analyzed the memoized Qbert, it was a little bit tricky. We had to think harder about why should it be um, n squared running time. So the analysis is usually much easier, straightforward, because we're just going to have like usually for dynamic programming, you just have a couple of for loops and if statements and stuff um, easier to analyze. And then, and then what are I should also say there are some more subtle advantages here. So like with space. It's the same big O, okay, but it's much more compact. More compact, and it's in order. So when you use a hash table, um, if you think about what you learned in your computer architecture class about caching and stuff, one big disadvantage of hash tables is that when you access two different things, even if they're um, right next to each other logically, they're going to be far apart in the hash table. That's the whole point of hashing is to put everything in kind of a random spot. That can be really inefficient when you're accessing everything in the table sequentially, but it's all over the place. Um, the, the CPU and the memory hierarchy, cache and RAM, doesn't know how to kind of optimize to help you out. So hashing is notoriously bad um, for that, for like cache complexity and, and, and accessing things in order. But when we have a dynamic programming solution and we're storing it in a table, it's going to be actually perfect for that, right? When we fill up this Fibonacci table, we're just going through an array in order and looking at the last two entries. Your CPU loves that. You have a for loop with an array where you're going through in order. Your CPU is like kissing you in the mouth. Um, and, and so that's, that's a big advantage in practice. And same with the runtime. Um, okay, it has the same big O of the, of the runtime but much faster in practice, usually. So it's, it's, it's not faster in terms of like a big improvement from exponential to polynomial time, um, but we have a smaller uh, constant in the big O because we're using like straight up forward for loops uh, rather than recursion. We totally save all the time of having to check the table. So with uh, memoization, you always have to check, is it in the table or not, and then put it in there. You don't have to worry about any of that with dynamic programming because you've already figured it out. I need to fill up the table in this order, and I know that the previous things I'm looking up are already there because I just had the, you know, that was the previous iteration of my for loop to fill them in. Um, so dynamic programming, you don't gain a lot asymptotically, but you gain um, like some really important constants in the running time. And it's, it's kind of, like I said, when you, when you come up, when you see that your memoization is helping you, it's usually worth then the extra effort to say, okay, let me think about how this memoization actually works. What is the table that's really being created? And then come up with this kind of more straightforward, easier to analyze 
um, easier on the CPU dynamic programming version of it. So that's the main thing. That's the main point of what I wanted to have for this video. The last small thing is I'm going to introduce the next problem, which you can guess that we're going to come up with a cool dynamic programming version of it. Um, but I just want to introduce the problem now. It's also related to um, your next programming project. And uh, so we can start kind of thinking about this problem. And you can start, if you want, uh, you can start thinking about a dynamic programming or a memoized version of how to solve this problem. But we'll kind of get to that next time. So the problem is we want to turn one string into another string. So you have two strings. And you want to say, how can I do these three operations of adding a letter, removing a letter, or switching a letter in order to turn one string into the other one? And I think you, if you took um, theory in the fall, I think you might have had a, a problem that was kind of like this, where you had to build a um, finite state machine that tested whether something was within edit distance one of another string. So here we're not just thinking about a single edit distance one, but but multiple edits, and we and we want to actually do it. So we're not trying to build a state machine in order to figure this out. We're trying to say how can we actually find the best, the fewest number of edits to change one string into another one, and actually make those changes. So as an initial example to kind of get the juices flowing here, if we think about reasonably and presentable. Um, so if we want to change reasonably into presentable. There's many, many ways to do it, but there is one best way to do it. Um, so what am I allowed to do? So from reasonably, I want to insert a P at the beginning. So I'm going to add a P. So presentably, um, then I need to remove this A. So that's two changes. Um, so that's presentably. Um, then I need to change this O to an E. So that O will get switched to an E. So we have presentably. Um, then we need to insert a T right here in between the N and the A. So we inserted the P at the beginning of the string. We can also insert anywhere in the middle. So we now we have presentably. And uh, the last thing to do is just to change this Y to switch this Y to an E. So now we have presentable. And you can count there's one, two, three, four, five changes. So there's five changes, which um, consist of two adds and um, one removal and two switches. One of the cool things about this problem is that it kind of works the same, uh, but the opposite from going from the other string backwards. So if we think about how would I change presentable into reasonably, well, where I added the P here, that means I want to remove the P here. Where I change, removed an A here, that means I want to add an A here. Where I changed the O to an E, now I change the E to an O. And adding the T becomes removing a T, and I change this E to a Y. Um, so it's also five changes, and really the same five changes to go backwards in the other direction. It's just that the adds become removes and the removes become adds. And so that's an important thing to understand to think about is that when I'm changing, trying to change one string to another, um, adding a letter is in one direction the same as removing a letter in the other direction. And so that's an important, helpful way to think about this problem. So that's the edit distance problem. I'll let you kind of ponder this and, and think about this, and we'll learn more about this uh, next class and moving forward. So uh, thanks for your time today. I hope you enjoyed thinking about dynamic programming. And don't worry, we're going to see a number of problems and puzzles and examples of how dynamic programming works. And uh, you'll get plenty of practice with that. Okay.